everyone. Today we're going to be moving on to our next topic in this class and beginning our module on simulation and sampling methods. We're going to begin with the topic of sampling. So sampling refers to the problem of trying to pick values according to some probability distribution or density. And very often, simulation and sampling will end up being closely related problems. Simulation is often a technique that we're really using to try to sample from a very complicated set of often coupled probability densities. So, for example, we might be interested in studying evolution within a population. We're interested in looking at how genetic bases, so sites within the genome, vary among different individuals within a population as that population develops. In some sense, we would often go about a problem like this using a simulation of evolution of that population, but really the goal is to understand and to sample from the probability distribution over possible values of different alleles and possible sites of the genome. So in some sense, when we're looking at simulation in the next module of this class, this is in many ways equivalent to the problem of sampling. And there are a lot of reasons why we care about this topic. So often we will be interested in simulating experimental data. An example of this might be exactly the population situation I was telling you about. It may be that we want to develop computational algorithms that will apply to very large population studies, maybe studies that are hard to do or that haven't been done yet, that maybe aren't even feasible with current technologies. And so in order to develop our algorithms, we might want to look at simulations, develop a simulation that will produce data that looks like the data we're trying to get, and then that would give us a way of developing and testing our algorithms. For the same kinds of reasons, we might be interested in looking at how the algorithms perform under different assumptions, maybe trying out different scenarios for how we could gather our data. Should we look at more people in each population or more distinct populations? Simulations give us a way of seeing what the implications of that would be before we actually gather the data. Often we're interested in simulating to look for what are called emergent effects. So an emergent effect is a property of a complex system that is not apparent just from understanding the rules that govern the behavior of the system. So, for example, if we're studying a biochemical model, it may be that the system ends up producing a behavior we could not have predicted from first principles. Maybe it ends up oscillating in an unusual way or failing for an unexpected reason. Those are examples of emergent effects. Or another reason we might be interested in coming up with a simulation of a system about this. Another particular kind of specialized use of these kinds of techniques is statistical sampling, and especially statistical hypothesis testing. So in statistics, we're very often concerned with whether a given model of our data can be definitively rejected. So that is, whether quantitative measures of the data we actually observe can be plausibly explained with respect to some quantitative model of how the data would behave. Very often we are trying to reject such a model. For example, we might be looking at a model of whether a set of genes are related to one another, whether they influence a common phenotype, and we would like to be able to figure out whether measures of genetic variations in those genes could plausibly correlate to a degree observed in practice if, let's say, the genes were not in fact interacting with one another. By doing simulations and showing that under that null hypothesis, that assumption, we get data that cannot be reconciled with the data we actually see in the real world, we can come up with a way of saying that what is happening is not consistent with the null hypothesis and therefore that the genes are interacting in some way. So that would be another example of why we might be interested in simulation methods. And all of that is really to motivate this next module in the class and to motivate in particular the topic of today's lecture, which is some beginnings for how we can look at sampling. As we get further into the class, we'll look at more complicated kinds of simulations and more advanced methods for sampling from very complicated probability distributions. 
But today I want to look at some of the simpler cases and see how far we can get at sampling from relatively simple, straightforward probability distributions. And the way we're going to do this is to start with the easiest kinds of distributions and then see how we can build from there to more advanced types. So in some sense, the easiest sort of probability distribution to work from is a uniform distribution. And an especially easy case of this is what we call a discrete uniform probability density. And what this means is simply that we have a set of objects and we're trying to pick among those objects with equal probability for each object. So a simple example of that would be flipping a coin. If we have a fair coin, then it's either heads or tails with equal probability. So that would be an example of a uniform discrete density with two possible values we can pick. Now this is a good place to start because pretty much any modern computer programming language is going to have some way of approximately sampling from uniform discrete probability density. So if you're looking at C, for example, you would have a RAND or a random module. Some of your more modern pro programming languages are going to have functions that are quite a bit more sophisticated than these. They may have built-in versions for some of the harder distributions we'll be looking at a bit later in this class. But pretty much all of them will have something that has this effect of picking a random number more or less uniformly between zero and some maximum value call that C max. And this would be what we would treat as essentially the basic operation that you're going to use to build more complicated sampling methods. Now I'm not talking here about how exactly they go about this. It's, it's kind of complicated and actually interesting in some applications and there's some places where you need to know about this. So what they really do is use what's called usually pseudo-random number generations. And pseudo-random number generation is not really generating random numbers. It's using some kind of deterministic procedure to compute sequences of numbers that look random by basic tests of randomness. In some cases, these numbers will fail tests that are important to what we're trying to do. So they may be non-random in ways that actually affect the results of our applications. But that doesn't come up too often. If you want to know more about this, I've put some supplementary notes on the online. And you can read about it in the references that are cited in the, the text. The Knuth, for example, or the Numerical Recipes series would tell you a bit about these things. But for the moment, what I want to assume is that we are able to get a uniform random number from a set of integers 0 to z max. And we would generally assume z max is a relatively large number with a relatively large integer. So it's going to be something like uh, 32768 or 32767, or maybe that square, relatively large. Now, if we can do this, then we can get relatively easily to at least an approximate uniform sample of a continuous range. So, for example, let's say we want to generate a uniform 0, 1 random variable, which means simply a random variable chosen uniformly from among the real numbers on the range 0 to 1. This is something we could generate if we had one of these basic operators. Let's say we had a random operator that generates a uniform discrete random variable. And the way we would typically do that is to say that if we can get a uniform discrete number on this range, then what we can do is take the function that generates that number, let's say random, and divide it by this maximum random value, z max. And of course, that's going to be a discrete number as well. It has no more possibilities than this finite range of numbers here. But for most purposes, that's going to be fine. It's going to give us a resolution of 1 over z max and generate a real number approximate on this range that's going to be something we can use in most of our calculations and treat as if it were really a uniform random number in that way. Now we can start from this, and this will really be the basic thing we're going to assume going forward. So we've assumed we can generate this discrete uniform random number. We've now shown that we can approximately generate this continuous uniform random number with some resolution 1 over z max. And we can then try to extend that and generate more complicated scenarios. Let's say, for example, we want to generate a uniform AB random number that is a uniform continuous random number on the range A to B. 
Well, we can do that if we can assume we can generate a uniform 0, 1 random number by simply saying that we would want to offset this by some amount a, and then scale it by the size of the range, b minus a, and then simply multiply that by our uniform 0, 1 random number. And that's going to give us approximately a uniform a, b random number. The resolution will be altered to be now b minus a over z max, so we may have a worse resolution if B minus A covers a wide range, but we'll still get something that we can use in most applications as an approximate continuous random variable. So this then is going to give us a slightly more complicated probability density. Now, most of what I want to talk about is going to be more involved than this, and unfortunately this is about as far as we can get using relatively simple transformations of our basic capability of generating discrete uniform random variables. And so we need to move on to some more complicated and more uh, theoretically challenging methods. But what I basically want to show is that this is still pretty much enough. Really, we're going to be assuming we can get to here and starting from that uniform 0, 1 uh, random variable, starting from that capability, show we can sample pretty much any random number. And there are two main methods we're going to be looking at to do that. The first of them known as the transformation method. So the transformation method follows from a theorem known as the fundamental transformation law of probabilities. And what the fundamental transformation law of probabilities concerns is how probability densities are related between functions of random variables. So let's say, for example, we've got a random variable, f of x, which is assigned according to the probability density, 1 over square root 2 pi sigma, e to the minus x minus sigma squared, or excuse me, x minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared. So this you should recognize as a particular kind of probability density. This in particular is a Gaussian random variable, also known as a normal random variable, and particularly a normal that we would parameterize with parameters mu and sigma squared, meaning it has mean mu and variance sigma squared. But this basically would be a way of defining a probability density for that random variable, and in particular for a sample x from that probability density. And so we can assume that we have this random variable x sample from Gaussian. So what I mean when I refer to a function of random variables is that if x is a random variable sample from this density, then we could also say y equals x plus 1 is a random variable. That sample from a density that is simply a Gaussian shifted by 1 on the axis. So that would be random variable of mean u plus 1 sigma squared. So, let's say in this case density g of y is normal with mean plus 1 variance sigma squared. But we can get into more complicated kinds of scenarios. Let's say instead that y were, was x squared, or y is x squared plus 1, or maybe x squared plus 1 plus 2 square root of x. All of those would be random variables y would have some probability density g of y, but it's not so obvious in those cases what probability density that would be. And that's what the fundamental transformation law of probabilities is all about, figuring out how the probability densities g of y and f of x are related to one another if we know the density of x and we know the function that transforms x into y. All right, so that's a lot of background on what this is all about, but now I'll just get to the statement of the fundamental tra transformation law of probabilities. And it is, given some random variable x with a density f of x, and given a function y of x, and we're assuming this is mapping real numbers to real numbers, so y is now a function of x and is itself a random variable, then the fundamental transformation law of probabilities asserts 
that y of x has density g of y, where g of y equals f of x dx dy. So that is the relationship between the densities of g and f, given that we know how y is a function of x, or how y is generated from x. And that turns out to be the key to coming up with a way to sample whatever density we want, given a density uniform 0, 1 that we know how to sample. And in particular, what we're going to be doing here is assuming that x is a uniform 0, 1 random variable, and try to figure out the transformation y to create a random variable whose density is some target density g of y. And the way this is going to work is as follows. Let's assume that we have x according to that density f of x. Then we can say that f of x dx, since x is uniform 0, 1, is simply going to be dx if x is between 0 and 1, and it's going to be 0 otherwise. So that is just an assertion about what it means for x to be a uniform random variable. And we're going to use that fact to show how to get y sampled correctly from a sample of x. Alright, so if we have established now that f of x dx is dx on the range 0 to 1, then we can say that g of y equals f of x dx dy, which is simply equal to 1 times dx dy, or just dx dy, if x is in the range 0 to 1. So using that fact, we can then generate another sample, and we can say dx dy equals g of y, and thus dx equals g of y dy, or integral dx equals integral g of y dy, just doing a series of transformations here. And finally from that we can say that x is equal to the integral of g of y dy, in particular it's going to be the integral from minus infinity to y of this value, and I suppose I should do the substitution here, g of u du, and the integral from minus infinity to y of g of u du is a concept that should be familiar to anyone who's studied their probability theory. This will denote by capital G of y is simply the cumulative distribution function corresponding to the density little g of y. So big G of y is the cumulative distribution, little g of y is the point density function. And with just one more step here, we can then say that y is equal to capital G inverse of x. And that pretty much gives us the complete transformation method. So what we've shown here going through all of these steps is that if we have an x that is sampled from the uniform 0, 1 density, then we take the cumulative distribution function for the density we're trying to sample, invert that, plug in x, what comes out, the value of y will be sampled according to the density little g of y. So in other words, putting that all together, we have the basic transformation method. So given some target little g of y, where we're trying to sample y from that probability density, we first find the distribution function, capital G of y is the integral minus infinity to y, little g of u du. So we take an integral, get from the density to the distribution. We will invert that, so we get y equals g inverse of x. So we now have the inverse of our distribution function. Sample our x. And then simply plug this x into the function g inverse, sample y according to probability density g of y. So that's basically all there is to the transformation.
Now this can be a bit confusing if you haven't seen it before, but there's a graphical interpretation of this that I think helps make it a bit easier to understand, and that works as follows. Let's take our number axes here. So we've got, let's say, we're going to put y on the horizontal axis here. So y is on what we would usually call the x-axis, and x is on the vertical axis that we'd usually call the y-axis. I know that's confusing, but that's the way these things come out here. And what we're going to plot is the cumulative and distribution function, capital G of y. Now, a cumulative distribution of a probability density has to always start in the limit as the density goes to minus infinity at a value of zero. And it has to go in the limit as we go to positive infinity to a value of one. A probability density always has to integrate to one. And so what we're going to get is something that maybe looks like the following. So it goes to a limit of one, limit of zero. And we can actually understand the transformation method in terms of this kind of diagram. And in particular, what we can think of when we're doing the transformation method is that essentially what we are doing is picking an x uniform 0, 1 on the x-axis here. So we're picking a number uniformly within this range, mapping that to the distribution curve, and dropping that down to the y-axis here to figure out what value of y we want. And we can understand why that would be the right thing to do in terms of one basic identity from probability, and that is the probability that y occupies any particular value or any particular range between, let's say, some lower value y0 and some upper value y1 is simply the difference between the cumulative distribution values of y0 and y1. So in other words, if you evaluate the function at, let's say this is y1, and we evaluate it, well, it would be y1, let's say we evaluate it y0, map this over here, then the difference between those two values mapped onto the vertical or x-axis here is going to be the probability that y lies within the range between those two values on the y or horizontal axis here. And you can kind of think intuitively why that would be. So if we have a range in which y has a high point density, so you have very likely values of y, you're going to have a high slope here. So you're carving out a large portion of the x-axis within that region of y corresponding to high point density or high slope in the distribution function. On the other hand, if you have a region of y that has a very low value of occurring, then you would tend to have a very flat curve here. So you're not increasing the distribution by much if y has a low point density, and so you map out a very small por portion of the x-axis here. So intuitively what this is saying is that this graphical interpretation tells us that you should have a high probability of y falling in regions of high slope, a low probability of it falling in regions of low slope, and that's basically what's going to come out from this way of doing the transformation method. So that's far from a proof, but if you think about this diagram, you should at least get some intuitive sense about why this method works. So there are some potential complications. The basic method here is pretty straightforward, but there are things that can go wrong in trying to do this. One of the obvious ones is that it may be that we can't do this integration step. So suppose g of u du is not integrable. This is not actually such an uncommon problem. So one of the most important probability distributions we're going to work with, or one of the most important probability densities, I should say, is one we've already seen, the Gaussian random variable, with density 1 over square root 2 pi sigma, e to the minus 
minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared. This density, let's say that that is g of x we're interested in, is not integrable. There's no closed form expression for this value, for the integral of this function. And so that would be an example where we can't quite apply the transformation method. It's not going to work because we'll get stuck here. Well, that's not an insolvable problem. We'll see later some other methods we can use for this. But even if we have a non-integrable function, you can actually use numerical integration. So basically, there are numerical ways to get an approximate value for the integral, which will allow us to, within whatever precision we want, get as close as we need to be to being able to integrate this function. So that's something we'll be examining a little later in the class when we get to continuous simulation methods. Numerical integration is the key to a lot of kinds of continuous simulation. But just remember that for now. This is not an insolvable problem if you can't integrate. There's another potential problem you can run into that we've actually already seen how to solve in a sense. And that is, what if g of y is not convertible. So maybe we've got some complicated function g of y, we do our integral, and maybe it ends up g of y is something really messy, like uh, uh, sine y plus square root of y e to the minus y to the 3 halves, or, you know what, I guess that's probably not the best choice. But let's say that was our, de our probability distribution g of y, and we couldn't figure out how to infer that. That also has a practical solution, and the practical solution there, just like with integration, is to use a numerical approximation. So we can do what is effectively numerically inverting our function. And we've actually already seen in this class the tools we would use to do that. So let's suppose, for the sake of argument, that we cannot figure out how to solve capital G inverse of x. We've got x, we know what the function capital G is, but we can't figure out how to do the inverse. Well, it turns out that that's something we can solve anyway by turning this into a problem we do know how to solve, and that is the problem of zero finding. In particular, if y is capital G inverse of x, then it must be the case that g of y equals x, and thus that g of y minus x equals 0. Well, if g of y minus x equals 0, then remember that what we're trying to do here is to take a sample value of x, so we know x, and we're trying to find a y, so y is unknown, and find it such that this function g, which we assume we do know, satisfies the equation g of y minus x equals 0. So g is a known function, x is a known value, it's a constant at this point. We've sampled it from a random variable. The only unknown is y. So effectively, we can say that this is some function h of y. And if we have some function h of y, then we can simply pose the problem of finding a 0 of h of y. It's just a zero-finding problem in one dimension, and we already know a few fine ways to do that. We can use the bisection method, we can use the secant method, we can use Newton-Raphson, whatever zero-finder we want. Apply that, find the y that makes g of y zero, and we've inverted our function numerically. So that gives us a way of getting around the situation that maybe we can't do this inverse step. But basically, that gives us the tools we would need to apply this in almost any kind of at least single variable, random variable sampling. Okay, so that gives us the basic principles of the transformation method. And I think the best way to appreciate how you would do this in practice is to look at an example. So let's look at an example of sampling 
an exponential random variable. So an exponential random variable is something that comes up quite a lot in the various kinds of simulation methods we'll be seeing. It's really one of the key kinds of uh, standard probability densities we need for many of the tools we'll be looking at. And it also happens to make a nice example for some of these cases because it, well, it, it keeps the math a bit cleaner than an obese for some more complicated densities. So let's look at how that would work. So an exponential density has the form g of y equals lambda e to the minus lambda y for y greater than or equal to zero and zero for y less than zero. So that gives us a probability density function that's going to look something like the following. It has value zero for any value of y less than zero and then it has some maximum value at zero, and then it kind of slowly tails off from there. How quickly it tails off depends on the parameter. So this is a probability density with a single parameter lambda, and for the exponential, that parameter is often referred to as the rate of the density. So if you have a density with a very high rate, it will fall off relatively quickly. If you have a density with a low rate, it will fall off more slowly. But basically, that is our probability density. Right, so if we want to apply the transformation method, then we need to walk through the steps of the transformation method and see how that would work out here. And the first step we need to do is to integrate. We know little g of y. We want to know big g of y. And so we're going to figure out the integral of that. So the integral of that we use to get a probability distribution canonically is the integral minus infinity to y of g of u, little g of u, that is, du. That's true for any continuous probability density. In this case, we know that little g of u is 0 for y, for y less than 0, so this really becomes the integral 0 to y of this function here, lambda e to the minus lambda y get lambda e to the minus lambda u du. This is just integrating an exponential. So if you want to integrate e to the minus lambda u, that's minus 1 over lambda e to the minus lambda u. So this is going to end up becoming e to the minus lambda u evaluated at the endpoints 0 and y. At a value of 0, this becomes 1. At a value of y, this becomes e to the minus So our final probability density, capital G of y, then, is 1 minus e to the minus lambda y. Okay, so now that we've got that, we have g of y equals 1 minus e to the minus lambda y, we next need to figure out how to invert that. So what we're trying to do, then, is to say that we have sampled some x, where x is going to be a uniform 0, 1 random variable, and we want to find y such that y equals e to the minus 1 minus, or excuse me, such that x equals 1 minus e to the minus lambda y. So we can do a little algebra here. We can say that that's equivalent to e to the minus lambda y equals 1 minus x, which is equivalent to minus lambda y equals natural log of 1 minus x. And finally, to saying y equals minus 1 over lambda, natural log of 1 minus x. So that, then, is the inverse of capital G of y. Now, if we want to turn that into a sampling method, then all we have to do is plug into that x equals a uniform 0, 1 random variable. So in other words, our actual sampling formula is going to be y equals minus 1 over lambda, log of 1 minus uniform 0, 1. And we can use one little simplification here that happens to apply in this particular case that 1 minus a uniform 0, 1 random variable is itself a uniform 0, 1 random variable. So in this case, 
in particular, we can simplify to y equals minus 1 over lambda, natural log of uniform 0, 1. And that basically is the entire sampling method for sampling a, an exponential random variable by the transformation method. We sample the uniform 0, 1 random variable, which we already know how to do. So we call our random routine or whatever, divided by the maximum possible random number, take the natural log of that, and divide it by minus 1 over lambda, and we get our desired exponential with rate lambda. All right, so as I mentioned, that is a relatively simple example of transformation method. Other densities are not going to be quite as easy to sample from that one. But if you understand the principles of how it's done here, you should be able to apply it to any other reasonably manageable density function we might give. Now, it's worth mentioning that we don't necessarily need to stick to transformation method on a single variable. Often what we'll be interested in when we get to harder sampling problems is sampling from joint probability densities. So sampling from densities where we have multiple random variables whose probabilities or whose random numbers are not independent of one another, so whose values depend on one another. And there is a generalization of the transformation method for that case. So you can generalize the fundamental transformation law of probabilities to say that if we've got some jointly sampled variables g of y1 through yk and a jointly sampled set of variables x1 through xk, where here y1 through yk are jointly or, or have a joint probability density g, x1 through xk are joint probability density f then the fundamental transformation law of probabilities does give a generalization that the relationship between these is explained by multiplying f by the determinant of a matrix built from all of the partial derivatives of values of x with respect to values of y. So partial of x1 with respect to y1 through partial of x1 with respect to yk partial of xk with respect to y1, partial of xk with respect to yk, and so forth. So that will give a multi-dimensional version of the fundamental transformation law of probabilities that can be used to build a multi-dimensional version of the transformation method. In practice, that is much harder to use than the one-dimensional version, and usually you're not going to have any straightforward way of figuring out what set of y values you want to pick or what set of transformation functions you want to pick to turn, let's say, a set of uniform random variables into your desired density. So it's, it's not so useful in practice, for at least as a level we'll be working at. It's more of a proof technique where if you can figure out a good way to do this, it gives you a way of proving it. So I'm not going to go into it here. We'll be seeing other methods later in the class that are somewhat easier to use for getting uh, samples of a uh, couple random variables, so sample from a joint density. We'll be covering that in the next week. But for now, just be aware there are generalizations of this, but uh, pretty much that tells you how the transformation method works. All right, so at this point, though, what I'm going to assume is Let's say we're looking at some probability density, and let's say the transformation method is not working out for us. So maybe we're trying to sample some density, and let's say we're trying to sample a density f of x, and it's some really complicated thing. So this, I'm assuming, is the function little f of x, probability density, and maybe it's this really messy function that it's hard to integrate, and it's hard to invert, and it's got all these uh, uh, non-smooth regions and sharp curves that make it hard to even work with with numerical integration and numerical zero finding. So we can't use the transformation method. Well, this is a situation where we might want to turn to an alternative, and we're going to cover one main alternative. And the idea behind the rejection method is that if we've got a density like our f of x that's hard to sample from, 
we can turn the problem of sampling it into a problem of sampling from an easier density, let's call it g of x. And we just need g of x to satisfy a few basic properties for us to more or less be able to sample from f of x by sampling from g of x. And the most important property is that g of x has to strictly upper bound f of x. So for any value of x, g of x is greater than or equal to f of x. So g of x is going to be some kind of envelope curve that sits on top of f of x. And again, it can touch it, can touch the curve, so maybe it can dip down like this, but it can never drop below f of x. It has to be at least as large. We are also going to need the property that the area under g of x, so that is integral minus infinity to infinity, g of u du, is finite. So for this method to work, we need a finite area under g of x. So that would be the space here. But as long as we can find a g of x that has these, we can use this method. It will matter what A is, and in particular, the efficiency of this method is going to depend on how tightly G of X fits on top of F of X. Ideally, you want A to be as small as possible, but you want to do this while balancing the fact that you need to be able to sample under G of X. And the way the method is going to work is by relying on a basic intuition for another way of sampling probabilities, another way of thinking graphically about what it means to sample a probability from a density of, say, f of x. So an alternative graphical way of illustrating what it means to sample from f of x is simply the following. Let's take this curve, so we have x now on the x-axis, we've got, let's say, in this case we're looking at f of x on the y-axis, and what we're going to say here is just pick any point uniformly in the two-dimensional space under this curve. So uniformly sample a point anywhere under here. Drop that down to the x-axis here, and then I'm going to declare that the x that that drops down to is actually sampled correctly from f of x. Intuitively, this actually makes some reasonable sense. So if we look at two different points here, and let's say we look at a point one where f of x is half as large as at a point two here. So we're looking at points where f of x is twice as large here as here. And we can ask, how likely should we be relatively to sample this point versus this point? Well, the meaning of the probability density is that that is basically the relative probability of sampling any particular point. If f of x here at, let's call this x2, is twice as large as f of x at this other point x1, then we should be twice as likely to sample x2 as x1. And that is what is accomplished by sampling uniformly under the area under the curve. So if we have half the height here, then that means we are half as likely to be in this little region under x1 as we are to be in the region under x2. So again, that's far from a proof, but it is an intuition why picking a point uniformly under a curve and then seeing where that falls on the x-axis is actually giving you a correct sample from the density corresponding to that distribution. And that basically is the key behind the rejection method. So what we want to do is pick a point uniformly under f of x, but we're assuming that that's hard to do. So what we're going to do instead is pick a point uniformly under g of x. And since we get to pick g of x, we can design a g of x where that's easy to do. So we can pick a g of x that we know how to sample under. We're going to pick an x-coordinate by sampling from g of x. We're going to pick a y-coordinate by sampling uniformly on the line between 0 and the value of g at that particular value of x. That will give us a point uniformly under g of x. And then we just do the following. If that point we picked happens to also be under f of x, then we know that we have not just sampled a point uniformly under g of x, we've also sampled a point uniformly under f of x. So the points under g of x that are also under f of x are, if we've sampled uniformly from among g of x, must be sampled uniformly from among f of x. 
On the other hand, if we happen to pick a point that's in the space between f of x and g of x, then we don't have a useful sample, but we can just try it again. We throw that away, try again, and just keep doing this until we happen to get a point that is under f of x. And we know when that finally occurs, it's correctly sampled from the density of f of x. So that's basically all there is to the rejection method. Now we need a bit more math to actually apply that in practice, though. The first thing we need to know is that we're going to have to sample uniformly under g of x. And the reason this function, the area, is important is because that's actually going to be the key to sampling under g of x. In particular, what it means to sample under g of x, as I've said, is to pick a point correctly sampled from the, from the x-coordinate under the curve, using the density that will derive from g of x, and then pick a uniform y-coordinate for that point under g of x. And to do the first part of that, we need to find a probability density whose point values are proportional to the values of g of x, but that, in fact, is a properly formed probability density. Now, g of x cannot itself be a probability density unless it happens to be exactly f of x. And the reason for that is that a probability density, as I mentioned before, must obey the property that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of that density, g of u du, has to be exactly 1. Since f, by our assumption, is a probability density, that integral, which is equivalent to the area under the curve f, has to uh, integrate to 1 if we integrate over the entirety of curve f over the entire range of the x-axis. Since g upper bounds f, unless g is exactly equal to f, there has to be space in between them, so g has to be greater than f. That is, the integral has to be greater than 1 for g. However, that pretty much tells us what we need to do to turn g into something we can sample from, and that is, we simply say that 1 over a g of x is something we can sample from. Because it must be the case that the integral minus infinity to infinity of 1 over a g of u du is exactly equal to 1, since a is defined as the integral minus infinity to infinity of g of u du. So in other words, what all of this is leading up to is to say that even though g isn't a probability density, 1 over a g is a probability density and we can get the proper x-coordinate and the proper sampling by simply drawing a random variable from the density 1 over a g. So that, then, is the first step of the transformation method, or excuse me, the rejection method. Sample from the density 1 over a g of x. And again, we get to pick g of x, so we will just pick one where that is easy to do. We next need to get the y-coordinates if we've got a point uniformly under g of x. Once we've got the x-coordinate, we simply sample y uniformly from 0 to g for that particular value of x. So uniform 0 to g of x. We then are going to check if we've picked a sample that's valid for f of x. In particular, if y is less than f of x, so we plug in that same value of x we sampled here. We plug that into f of x. We see if y is smaller than that. If it is, then we know we've got a valid sample of x, so we just return x. Otherwise, we just go back to step one. We've got an invalid sample, so we try again. So that basically is the entire rejection method. Now, it is worth understanding how we would figure out whether this is going to terminate in a reasonable amount of time. This method is not going to be very useful if we need to run some astronomical number of loops through this before we happen to get a good sample. So to really be able to use this in practice, we're going to want to be able to show that, on average, we're not going to need too many trials. And it turns out that the key thing to understand how efficiently this runs is, again, this quantity A. 
So the probability that a point sampled under g of x is also under f of x, we can derive by considering the ratio of the areas of the, under those curves. f of x is a probability density, so the area under f of x has to be 1. g of x is not a probability density, the area under it is a. And so the probability we make it through this loop with a successful trial is simply 1 over a. Or in other words, we need an average of A trials to get a successful sample. And that's why we want G of X to be a relatively tight bound on F of X. We can't just have some huge G of X that is uh, completely unrelated to f of x. If you want this method to work efficiently, you want g to be close to f without ever going below the curve f. And that's kind of the tricky part in designing these. But it's not such a big deal if g is twice f of x or even 10 times f of x. Just need to run it a few extra steps. And that's usually not so hard to arrange. All right, so. In the text, I've given an example of how this would work for using the rejection method to sample from normal random variables. So here I'm going to present a somewhat different example that illustrates how this can get a little more messy in practice than we see here, but still adheres to the basic principles I've been telling you. And in particular, I'm going to pick something that is sort of like the exponential random variable, but a little more complicated. And this is known as a gamma lambda 1 random variable. So the gamma random variables are a family of random variables. And actually, the exponential is equivalent to exponential lambda, that is, is equivalent to a gamma lambda 0 random variable. And with each increasing value of this, you transform it a little bit. But gamma lambda 1 is kind of the next level of complexity. And the gamma lambda 1 is defined by a density function of the following form. f of x equals lambda squared x e to the minus lambda x. So if we had a gamma 2, it would have an x squared e to the minus x term. Gamma lambda 3 would be x cubed e to the minus lambda x. But then this leading constant term gets more complicated as go to higher values. But for now, let's just say this is the thing we want to sample from. Now, we could apply the transformation method to this. It, it's, this is a, a solvable problem. But let's say we're having trouble with that. We can't figure out how to apply the transformation method. So we decide that we are going to apply the rejection method here. If we look graphically at what we're trying to do, then the gamma density is going to look something like the following. It's going to start at a value of 0 for x equals 0. So you've got x times e to the minus lambda x. That's 0 for x equals 0. It will rise to some peak, and then it will fall off, sort of like an exponential random variable, a little more slowly since it's got this leading parameter x. And so what we're going to want to do is come up with some envelope curve that you can fit on top of this, some g of x that will fit on top of this f of x, and that will give us a way to sample from the rejection method. Now, one reason I picked this is that it's a little harder than this picture here, because this covers an infinite range of the x-axis. You can't just fit a finite envelope here. It's always pretty easy to use the rejection method if you can do that. You need something that is going to tail off more or less like f of x. It's going to tail off fast enough that you get a finite integral, but slow enough that it never passes below f of x. So it can take some thought to figure out what such a curve would look like. But in this case, we can use the fact that this tails off sort of like an exponential, a little more slowly, but it will tail off faster than any exponential with a lower rate than lambda. So in other words, if we pick any exponential that has a rate lambda prime that is smaller than lambda, then there's some scaling factor we can apply to that to give us a g of x that is exponentially shaped that is going to entirely, strictly upper bound f of x. 
So in other words, what we're proposing is that we will say g of x has some general form, c e to the minus lambda prime x, where lambda prime is less than lambda, and for some value of c, that is going to work. It will work actually for any lambda prime less than lambda, but to keep the math a little simpler, let's say lambda prime is equal to lambda over 2. So half the exponential rate, and then what we're going to say is there must be some c that is sufficiently large that we will get a strict upper bound here. All right, so in other words, we have now declared g of x is c e to the minus lambda over 2 x. And what we need to do to apply this is to figure out what c can be. Now, you don't necessarily need to find the smallest possible c. As long as it's an upper bound and c isn't too big, it's going to be fine. We don't want c to be infinite. We don't want c to be a, a huge value because the efficiency of the method depends on that. The area under g will scale with c. But we want to find something to guarantee that at the lowest point of g, or the closest it gets to f of x, it never actually goes below it. So in some sense, what we're trying to assert here is that c e to the minus lambda over 2 times x has to be strictly greater than or equal to lambda squared x, e to the minus lambda x, for any x. And both of these curves, I should say, are w0 for x less than 0, just x greater than or equal to 0. So in other words, we can say any x greater than or equal to 0. Well, with some transformation, that's equivalent to saying that c greater than or equal to lambda squared x, e to the minus lambda x, over e to the minus lambda over 2 x, or equivalently, lambda squared x, e to the minus lambda over 2 x. So if we want a c that bounds f as tightly as possible, then essentially what we'll want to do is instead of making this a greater than or equal to, just make it an equality. So the smallest possible c is going to be the c that sets this to be true for every value, you know, for every value of x, or at least sets it to be true for the worst possible value of x. So we need to figure out then what is the worst possible value of x. So in other words, what is the largest this can be? And we should all remember how to figure out what the largest possible value of a function it takes on could be. That's simply a maximization problem. And as we should remember from our discussion of continuous optimization, the maximum value of a function or its stream of a function in general occur at points where the derivative of the function is zero. So in other words, we want to find the value of x that corresponds to the point where the derivative of that value, lambda squared x e to the minus lambda over 2x, is equal to 0. And that x is going to be the one that defines the extreme point, so that sets the lower possible bound of c for g to be strictly an upper bound of f. Well, if we take the derivative of that function, what we're going to end up with is lambda squared e to the minus lambda over 2 x plus lambda squared x minus lambda over 2 e to the minus lambda over 2 x is equal to 0. A lot of that, fortunately, will cancel out. So we can cancel out these lambda squareds. We can cancel out e to the minus lambda over 2 x. What we're going to end up with is simply 1 minus lambda over 2x is equal to 0, or x equals 2 over lambda. So that tells us that the point x equals 2 or la over lambda is an extremum of our function, and in particular, it's going to give us the smallest possible value of c. So in other words, we plug this value into that formula here. We're going to end up with lambda squared 2 over lambda e to the minus lambda, excuse me, e to the minus lambda over 2 x over e to the minus lambda over 2 
2 over lambda, which is equal to 2, 2 over lambda, which with a bunch of simplifications comes out to 2 lambda over e. So in other words, what we've shown here is that the best possible value of c, or at least the one that produced the tightest envelope curve, is c equals 2 lambda over e. And we can then plug that into our formula here and say that our final value of g of x is equal to 2 lambda over e, e to the minus lambda over 2 x. So that is going to be the best possible envelope curve that follows this rate lambda over 2. And we could try to optimize a better rate. Essentially, there will be some trade-off between how large c has to be and the, trying to get a rate that is closer to the rate of lambda. But more or less, this is a value we can use that will hopefully produce a decent envelope curve. And we can figure out how good an envelope curve it is by figuring out the area under it. And that would be simply the integral 0 to infinity of 2 lambda over e e to the minus lambda over 2x dx. And with some simplification, that's going to come out to 4 over e e to the minus lambda over 2x, evaluated at 0 and infinity, which is simply 4 over e. So knowing that the area under the curve is 4 over e will tell us two interesting things. First of all, since we know that 1 over a g of x is going to be a probability density, that tells us that e over 4, so 1 over this, times 2 lambda over e, e to the minus lambda over 2 x is going to be a probability density. And with some optimization, that's going to be 1 over lambda over 2, e to the minus lambda over 2 x. And this we should recognize as simply the formula for an exponential random variable. So in particular, this is an exponential of parameter lambda over 2. And that's going to tell us how we are going to sample under g. We're going to get the x-coordinate by sampling from an exponential lambda over 2 random variable, which we already learned how to do by the transformation method. The other thing this is going to tell us is the efficiency of the method. So when we're finally done with this, we know that 4 over e is going to be the fraction of samples that end up successful. That comes out to roughly 1.5. So in other words, we need to try on average 1.5 passes of the rejection method to get a successful sample. And that's pretty good. It's going to work uh, at least most of the time. So if we put all of that together, we pretty much at this point have a rejection method sampler for our gamma lambda 1 random variable. And the pseudocode will go as follows. We sample our x-coordinate sampled from under g of x. And that is, as we now know, equivalent to sampling an exponential random variable with rate lambda over 2. So that gives us the x-coordinate of our point uniformly chosen under g of x. We next sample the y-coordinate of that point. And that we choose to be uniform between 0 and the value of g at this value of x. So that is uniform between 0 and 2 lambda over e, e to the minus lambda over 2x. And then we simply need to decide if this is a valid sample point for f of x. So if y is less than lambda squared x, e to the minus lambda x. So that is, if this chosen value of x plugged into the formula for f of x, gives us a value that is greater than y, then we return x. That means that our point is under f of x. Otherwise, go to step one and sample another point. 
And as we figured out here, we need on average 1.5 passes through this loop before it's successful. So usually it's going to succeed on the first trial. Each trial is effectively independent, so it becomes very unlikely we'll need to do this more than a few times before we get one successful sample. So that basically is the rejection method. Right, so as I mentioned before, this does get more complicated in some cases, especially when we start getting to joint densities of random variables. Just like with the transformation method, you can generalize the rejection method to densities of multiple variables. You just have to put a multi-dimensional surface over the multi-dimensional surface defined by your joint density f of x1, x2, x3, whatever. So that is doable. but as I mentioned, usually we're going to be using other methods that we'll be seeing in the next week. There is one complication I do want to go through, though, and that is that these don't quite apply the same when we are looking at discrete probability densities. So in a discrete probability density, we have a probability density with either a finite set of possible values or random number that takes on a finite number of values or at least a countably infinite number of values like the integers. You can actually generalize the transformation and the rejection method to work with discrete random variables but it's not 100% straightforward so I want to go through that here. So in particular let's start with the discrete transformation method. So the transformation method in the continuous case had a graphical interpretation, and in the discrete case, the same graphical interpretation is actually helpful for understanding how the method works and how we would generalize it to this case. So in the discrete case, we're going to assume that we've got a probability density, and in particular, our random variable x, we're going to assume we take on some integer value k. It doesn't actually matter if they're chosen from a set of integers. It's more or less equivalent, but let's say it takes on a set of integer values. And we'll say that for any particular integer k, there is a discrete probability p sub k of the random variable x taking on value k. This would be the discrete analog of the probability density function. So this is known as the point density, or you would simply still refer to it as the density. And we can also talk about a discrete analog of the probability distributions, the cumulative distribution function, and that then would be simply the probability that x is less than or equal to k, and that we can express as simply the sum i equals whatever our minimum value is, so let's say, let's say it starts at 1, i equals 1 to k of p sub k. So this sum would be the equivalent of the uh, continuous uh, cumulative distribution function, so this is still known as the distribution or cumulative distribution. And in terms of doing the transformation method, we can graphically visualize what the cumulative distribution function would look like by simply imagining that we have a set of discrete values here, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. And we can plot the values of this sum at each of these integers. So at the value 1, we would have a peak with a height of p sub 1, so that would be simply the probability it is exactly 1. The cumulative distribution at point 2 would have height p sub 1 plus p sub 2. At 3, it would have height p sub 1 plus p sub 2 plus p sub 3, and so on. You get a monotonically increasing function, and the limit as we go k up to infinity, it would eventually converge on a value of 1, just like in the continuous case. And so we can pretty much use the same kind of method as we would use in the continuous case. We can say that for any particular value of k, we're going to get this sum, i equals 1 to k, p sub i. We sample our uniform 0, 1 value of x that will hit some point on this axis here. And then we simply map across until we hit the first of these boxes that is not below the sample value. 
So whatever value of x we've chosen here, first box it hits, that is the value we return, that value k. That's basically the same thing as we're doing in the continuous density, and it works just fine in discrete densities. Algorithmically, it can be a little more complicated because we're trying to effectively invert this discrete function. So we're trying to figure out the inverse of a discrete set of values, a discrete function that can be harder to do in some cases. Sometimes we can just do this analytically. We can figure out what is the smallest value of k from this, the, the function of the sum. When we can't, we would often want to do something like the following. So this would be pseudocode for a more general discrete transformation method. Effectively, what we're going to do is sample x from our uniform 0, 1, still continuous density. And then we can kind of work through this uh, backwards in a sense. We start with some i equals 1. And then what I'm going to say is, while well, x is greater than pi, we'll say x gets x minus pi, i gets i plus 1. And when we're finally done with this, return i. What this is going to do effectively is keep subtracting off successive values. So we're going to see, is x greater than p1? If not, then we go to the next loop, subtract off p2. That will test if x is greater than p1 plus p2. If not, subtract off p2. The next loop will test if x is greater than p1 plus p2 plus p3. Basically, keep taking off successive values until we've dropped x below the next value. So it's simply an equivalent way of doing this that has a little better properties from any common distributions in that effectively rather than trying to add up what are often very many small numbers which will start getting lost with round off errors, you try subtracting from the beginning. And for your common kinds of distributions that more or less fall off with increasing values of k, this will have a little better numerical properties. Sometimes this is not going to be practical though. Because it might be that the correct value of k is going to be k equals you know, 100 trillion or whatever. And you don't want to run through 100 trillion steps of this loop. And so sometimes, just like in the continuous case, we will want to apply a different method. And we can use, in that case, a discrete rejection method. The discrete rejection method can also be understood graphically, and the basic idea behind it is simply to take our discrete probability density function, so this is now the density rather than the distribution as we were using here, so we'll have some set of values, p1, p2, p3, and so forth, and we'll convert it into a continuous function by doing what we call a continuous extension basically turn it into a step function like what I was showing there, where we will say that rather than having a point value, just an integer value of 1, we'll define it to have a value of p sub 1 on the range from 0 to 1. And we'll define it to have a value of p sub 2 on the range from 1 to 2, and a value of p sub 3 on the range from, one to, from 2 to 3, and so forth. So that is simply a continuous step function extension of our discrete probability density. And then once we've done that, we can apply a rejection method just like we do in the continuous case. Find some bounding curve, see if a point uniformly sampled under the bounding curve is also under the actual discrete density. If it is, then you pick whichever of these boxes it fell under. If it isn't, then you go back and try it. To see how that works, let's pick an example of a discrete density. And I'm going to pick a common kind of density you would be interested in, and that is a geometric random variable. So geometric random variable we can think of as being the number of trials of a simple uh, Boolean or indicator random variable that we need before we get a successful trial. So in other words, if you're thinking of your Boolean or indicator random variable as being tossing a coin, then the geometric would correspond to how many to tosses of the coin do we need before we get heads. So if you have a fair coin, we would get a geometric 
with parameter one half, so the probability of heads on each trial is one half, and we can ask, can we sample probabilities from this geometric one half random variable? Well, we can understand in general how this behaves by thinking about the coin example. So if you're asking how many times you have to flip a fair coin to get heads, then the probability that we get a heads on the first flip is going to be one half. So half the time we flip it, we get heads, and then the value of the geometric is one, half the time we get tails. If we've gotten tails, then the next flip, half the time we'll get heads, and so P2 is going to be one fourth. The way you would get two flips to get your first head is going to be that you get tails on the first flip and the heads on the second flip. P3 would be one eighth. To get that, you need to get tails on the first flip, tails on the second flip, heads on the third flip. So it's one half probability of tails on the first flip, one half of tails on the second flip, one half of heads on the third flip. And in general, P sub K is going to be one over two to the K. So that basically is the discrete probability density we're interested in sampling from. And we can try plotting that. So we can say that there is some value one here. We get different possible values from the sample space of values of the geometric random variable. There is a probability of one half. That we get a value here. There's a probability one fourth that we get a value of two. There's a probability one eighth that we get a value of three, and so forth. So we're going to get these successively decaying peaks. So if we want to apply the rejection method to that, the first thing we're going to want to do is create a continuous step extension of this function. And we're going to do that by simply connecting each of these through so that we have our step extension f of x has a value on the range 0 to 1 that is equal to p sub 1, value on the range 1 to 2 that's equal to p sub 2, and so forth. So we'll just define that this has a value 0, first of all, for x less than or equal to 0, and then 1 half for x in the range 0 to 1, 1 fourth for x in the range two, one eighth for x in the range two to three, and so forth. In the general case, we're going to be saying it is one over two to the k for x in the range, well, this would be k minus one to k. And we can simplify that by saying that it's simply zero for x less than or equal to zero, and one half to the scaling of x for x greater than or equal to zero. So that then is going to be our continuous extension, and we're going to want to put an envelope curve on top of that to do our discrete sampling. And so if one half to the ceiling of x is going to be the value of our envelope curve, then what we're going to want is something that looks sort of like that, that bounds it relatively closely, but that we know how to sample under. And we can actually come up with something that is a variant of a function we've seen a few times now, and that is to try to make a, an exponential function that fits this curve as tightly as possible. In particular, if we are trying to sample under one half to the ceiling of x, then that means on any given range, we can bound x by the following function. g of x equals zero for x less than or equal to zero, and g of x equals simply one half to the x for x greater than or equal to zero. I guess let's make this strictly less than. And what that's going to look like in terms of this diagram here is it's going to hit the value of one at x equals zero, 
then it's going to have an exponential decay that precisely hits the right endpoints of each of these steps here. So it's going to be the exponential that fits this uh, discrete step curve as closely as possible. Exponential, and that is going to fit our discrete curve relatively closely. Now we can observe that this is in fact an exponential function, even though I haven't written it in the, the standard form of an exponential, by noting that one half to the x is simply what we would get if we take the exponential of the log of one half to the x. Log of one half to the x is equal to x log of one half which is equal to minus x log 2, or in other words, this is equivalent to e to the minus x times the natural log of 2. So that tells us that this is decaying exponentially with a rate parameter of, of natural log of 2, and that should tell us immediately how we would, how we would get a sample under g of x. So if we take the area under g of x, minus infinity to infinity, g of u du, that's equivalent to the integral 0 to infinity, e to the minus u log 2 du, which is simply 1 over natural log of 2. Or in other words, that 1 over a of g of x is going to be log 2 e to the minus x log 2, which, not surprisingly, is a density function for an exponential random variable. In particular, it's an exponential random variable with rate parameter log 2. And that pretty much tells us how we can sample from this particular density. So we want to sample from 1 over a g of x, which means we get x sample from an exponential random variable with a parameter log 2. And as we know back from the beginning of the talk, we can sample from an exponential random variable with parameter log 2 by just taking minus 1 over log 2 times the natural log of a uniform 0 1 random variable. So we know how to do that. We next want to sample y as a uniform random variable between 0 and the value of g. So g is e to the minus x log 2. So take the value of x we sampled in the first term, plug it into e to the minus x log 2, sample uniformly between 0 and that value, we've got a value of y. We then do our rejection step. So if the value of y we picked is smaller than the value of f for that value of x, which is simply this thing here, one half to the ceiling of x. If that's true, then we've got a valid sample. So then return x. And if it's not true, we go back to step one. So that then is our rejection sampler for this discrete curve where we're trying to sample a geometric random variable. And just as with our other rejection samplers, we would want to verify that this is something that's going to run reasonably efficiently. So we should know that the number of trials we need on average is going to be A. The, the probability a particular trial succeeds is 1 over A. And so, in other words, the number of trials we need on average is going to be 1 over natural log of 2, which is about 1.44. So in other words, most of our trials are going to succeed. It's very unlikely we'll need to run through this more than a few times before we get a correctly sampled geometric random variable. Now, of course, you might just say, why not just flip coins until you get heads? That would be about as efficient in this case. So it's more of a toy example, but for more complicated kinds of densities, you can often get something that will work much more efficiently than uh, flipping coins many times. So let's say we had a very biased coin, maybe you don't want to flip a coin that only gets heads one time in a million and try to figure out how many flips you need to get a good sample.
But anyway, that is a simple example. It should illustrate to you how we can take the transformation or rejection methods and extend them to the more complicated kinds of scenarios we were considering before. So in the coming lectures, we're going to be seeing how we can generalize this to harder sorts of probability distributions. And as I mentioned, but one of the particular things we'll care about that we haven't seen today is how to generalize to joint distributions and multiple correlated variables. But for now, this gives you kind of the basic tools for sampling for most sorts of random variables. If you refer to the texts that we, well, that I cite in the, the, the textbook for this class, you can see a more extensive library of many kinds of distributions where these are known. So the press or Knuth, and there are also some supplementary notes on some of, some of these topics in random number generation. But basically, these are kind of the keys. And then we'll see how we generalize later. Questions? <laughs>